Hello, Snake. It's been a while, hasn't it? I hear you've been causing quite the ruckus in Nicaragua. Nothing much to report from my end. The legacies being put to good use. Or so they tell me. But enough with the small talk. There's something I need to tell you. You saw the photo that came with this tape, right? The boss gave that to me. Ten years ago. <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have told you sooner. I probably should have told you right away. But sending it to you hasn't been an easy decision to make. It's taken me ten years. Once you've heard what I have to say, you'll understand why. That photo belonged to her. I know what you're thinking. What does she have to do with this? You've probably seen it a hundred times in the press already. Obviously, it's of the Mercury 7, the first group of American astronauts, the heroes of Project Mercury. But there were actually eight people in that photo. One of them was edited out, erased, without a trace. That eighth astronaut, the one airbrushed out of existence, that was her, Snake. Now why did they need to keep her existence a secret? What were they trying to hide? The answer goes back even further. 17 years ago. It was the height of the Cold War. The Eastern and Western blocs were racing to develop space technology to match their nuclear arsenals. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite. The Americans were stunned. They'd been led to believe their country led the world in science and technology. That shock quickly turned into fear. If the Russians had the know-how to launch a satellite into space, they could use it to launch a nuclear missile, too. Frantic, the U.S. threw everything it had into the space race. The following year, the Army succeeded in launching the first American satellite, Explorer 1. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration was established that fall, and Project Mercury with it. The goal was to send a man into space, and seven men were chosen as pilot candidates. The media dubbed them the Mercury Seven. They were immediately hailed as national heroes, icons of Western space exploration. But after Explorer, America suffered a series of failed rocket launches. Desperate, the government made a fateful decision. Unable to wait for its space program to mature, they'd steal the Soviets' technology, at the same time sabotaging their space program. You know better than anyone how hard a mission that was. The Soviet space program was shrouded in secrecy. Recovering that information would be no easy task. Using the help of an insider, they'd insert a sleeper agent into the research institute, or else recruit one of those insiders to do the job for them. And, if necessary, the mission leader would have to go in and sort things out themselves. Someone was needed with experience, knowledge, and superior intuition. And the only one for the job was the boss. The president himself asked for her by name. He needed someone who could be trusted with the fate of a nation. Who else to turn to but the hero of the Second World War? It was June 1959. So you see, Snake. That's why she left. That was the top secret mission that took her from you. But her selection ruffled a few CIA feathers. They didn't appreciate the president going over their head like that. The mission was tough enough already, and now the CIA was dragging its feet. She couldn't get anything out of them. No manpower, no information. Left to her own devices, the boss made a decision she knew would come back to haunt her. She decided to tap into the Philosopher's Network. And that's when the wheels of fate began to turn. The Philosophers were a secret society of power brokers formed in a pact between the US, Russia, and China in the early 20th century. 
Of course, by that time, the American and Soviet branches had already parted ways. But there were those among the remaining Russian philosophers, not entirely happy with the one-party communist state. The boss reached out to them. She arranged clandestine meetings in Berlin, hoping to find a way into OKB-1, the Soviet's premier design bureau. She worked tirelessly to win their sympathy, in some instances using huge sums of cash, in others by helping them over the Berlin Wall. It was a dangerous game to be playing. The philosophers had everything on her, and not just information either. She'd given birth to a child on the battlefield, only to have them immediately snatch it away. I know she told you that story. If that child was in the hands of the Soviet philosophers, she'd be putting more than just herself in danger. But she did what she had to do. At the time, the Soviet Union was believed to have an arsenal of missiles far greater than that of the United States. If that proved to be the case, Moscow would be free from the yoke of nuclear deterrence, raising the possibility that the Soviets might actually launch nukes if they felt it necessary. As you know, the so-called missile gap turned out to be a Soviet bluff. Moscow had gone to incredible lengths to perpetuate the lie. In fact, the whole space race was really just a part of an elaborate ruse. Only we didn't know that at the time. <sighs> she used to joke that even she swallowed the whole missile gap story, hook, line, and sinker. She put her life on the line for the sake of her country to prevent nuclear war. And it was because of her sacrificial efforts that America succeeded in placing a sleeper agent inside OKB-1. NASA began to receive huge volumes of technical data from the Soviet program. By the end of 1959, they'd succeeded in sending a chimpanzee named Sam on a ballistic rocket flight. The rocket never left the atmosphere. But all the same, it was a huge success for NASA, restoring confidence in its technology. Then, just when the operation was starting to produce results, the CIA came calling. You're a war hero, they said. No need for you to dirty your hands with this sort of black ops. We'll take it from here. In effect, they wanted to reap the rewards for themselves. But the boss didn't object. My part is over, she said. I don't care what you do with the data now. It seemed as if NASA was making great strides toward manned spaceflight while the Russians lagged behind. They even got a report from their mole at OKB-1. The safe return of Sam has sent our scientists into a panic, he said. Soon afterward, the Soviet Union sent an animal of its own into space on Sputnik 2. The dog Kudryavka better known to the world as Laika. But Laika was fated never to return to Earth. The U.S. can recover its spacecraft from the ocean upon re-entry. But the Soviet Union only borders the frozen Arctic. They had to bring their spacecraft down on land. How could they soften the impact enough to bring a living creature back safely? The agent reported that the Soviets hadn't yet found a solution to that problem. The plot to sabotage the Soviet space program seemed to be working, too. First, they tampered with Sputnik 4's re-entry. Then, two months later, one of their rockets exploded on the launch pad. They did manage to send two dogs into orbit aboard Sputnik 5 and return them safely to Earth. But the agent dismissed it as a fluke. Dogs, sure, but humans? They didn't have the technology. Everybody believed it. Everybody was complacent. Everybody. Except the boss. There was something about the Sputnik 5 schematics they were getting that didn't seem right. Some kind of ejection device on the capsule that didn't quite belong. She couldn't figure out the reason why it was there. What was it supposed to eject? NASA shrugged off her concerns. They figured it was probably meant to eject the flight recorder in case of an accident. The boss pleaded with them to investigate, but the CIA wasn't having it. 
They probably thought she was trying to reclaim some of the glory for herself. The boss wouldn't give up. She decided to head to the Soviet Union herself, alone, without any backing from the CIA. By the beginning of the next year, 1961, she'd succeeded in infiltrating OKB-1. That's when she saw the truth for the first time. The sleeper that she'd worked so hard to place was a double agent. He'd been turned by the Soviets and was feeding the Americans lies. But what shocked the boss even more was why. The CIA's access agent had been taking a large cut of the sleeper's pay. The sleeper felt what little he was left with wasn't worth the risk. When he got a better offer from Moscow, he took it. At some point, the Americans' intelligence operation had become an open book to the Soviets. And contrary to what the sleeper had been reporting, the Soviets' manned spaceflight technology was quite advanced. It wasn't until she infiltrated OKB-1 herself that the boss learned the truth about Sputnik 5. After the spacecraft re-entered the atmosphere, it ejected the pilot, seat and all, at an altitude of 7,000 meters. It was the Soviet solution to the problem of land recovery. The mystery device attached to Sputnik 5 was for that purpose. The pilot would parachute down from that high altitude wearing a bulky spacesuit. <laughs> Crazy, I know. The Soviets knew exactly how dangerous it was, of course. So much so that they gave Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, a special two-rank promotion before re-entry. Only Moscow could come up with this kind of plan. With total state control over information, they could easily pretend it never happened in the event of a failure. The boss passed the info on to NASA. It was their worst nightmare. The glory of mankind's first space flight was about to be stolen from them by the Soviet Union. It was Sputnik all over again. And the CIA was caught no less off guard. Their ineptitude had caused the fiasco in the first place. The Soviets' deception was brilliant. They'd woven a masterful tapestry of truth and fiction to convince the Americans their intelligence operations were proceeding as planned. No one but the boss could have seen through it. It was obvious the Soviets had some gifted minds working on their side. But that certainly didn't excuse the CIA's massive failure. The CIA wasn't done, though, and devised an ingenious plan to avoid taking responsibility. Luckily for them, a new president had been elected the previous November, John F. Kennedy. As he didn't know the case history when taking office, the CIA was able to feed lies to his new administration. They masked their own failures, placing the blame squarely on the boss's shoulders. After all, she'd selected an unreliable sleeper. They claimed she'd failed to make use of one of the most effective means of controlling a sleeper agent's actions, holding their family hostage. The boss was well aware that would have worked. She told me so later, but she couldn't bring herself to do it seems clear it had to do with having her own child taken. She could never inflict the same pain on anyone else. The CIA used that against her. In his election campaign, Kennedy had vowed to close the missile gap with Moscow. If America lost the space race, that promise would be worthless. The fact that the president had no links to the philosophers only made things worse. He was completely unaware of the secret networks she'd used to complete her mission. In his eyes, she was no better than a traitor. The fate that awaited her was cruel beyond belief.